Hi and good afternoon. So I'm Emily Hancox, a uh, Max Weber Fellow in the Law Department here at the EUI. And I'm Claire Bright, I'm also Max Weber Fellow here at the uh, EUI. And this is Professor Neil Walker, who's the richest professor of public law and law of nature and nations at the University of Edinburgh. Uh, so his uh, main ar area of expertise is constitutional theory. Uh, Neil has uh, published extensively on the constitutional dimension of legal order at the sub-state, state, supranational and international levels. Yeah, and um, this evening Neil will be giving a Max Weber lecture, the topic of which is When Sovereigns Star, which starts from Hobbes' idea of the sleeping sovereign and the divide between the people or the popular sovereign and the day-to-day -day conduct of government and then extends this metaphor and we're, we're very much looking forward to your lecture later on today. Thank you. So um, we have a few questions uh, for you, that's all right. So the first one was given the title of your lecture and how your work is related to sovereignty over the past few years, uh, we wanted to know why did you start working on the topic and how has your thinking on the idea of sovereignty evolved? Okay, good question. Uh, I've been working on sovereignty probably for a quarter of a century, perhaps more. And it's, it's a very natural thing to, to work on when you're dealing with state constitutional law, because sovereignty is right at the centre of, of the state. And uh, maybe coming from Scotland as well, there's a particular additional reason in that, certainly throughout my uh, academic career, there's always been an issue about Scottish autonomy, Scottish independence. So the so sovereignty, rather than simply being an accepted category, has always been a, a contested category, and, uh, and that in itself is interesting and, and would stimulate anyone's interest in the matter. I guess when I started looking at uh, transnational law, EU law, but also global law and other forms of international law, again, sovereignty remained a kind of insistent presence because however you think about these different categories of law, uh, part of our understanding of, of these is constituted through, to some extent, constrained by sovereignty. You know, we can't understand the international order unless we understand the resilience of national sovereignty. We don't understand some of the claims of the European Union unless we begin to understand these claims themselves as involving some kind of arrogation of sovereignty, or certainly that's the fear of many who, uh, who look at it. At the global level, we even have you know, the development of uh, 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 forms of thinking about the global uh, as itself involving a dimension of uh, sovereignty. When, uh, when Donald Trump uses the term, uses the term globalism, uh, he's trying to convey something about that. He's trying to convey something about, not about internationalism or cosmopolitanism, but about some notion of a kind of top, creeping top, top down authority at the international level. So there's a sense in which sovereignty uh, is very, very difficult to, to get rid of. It's something which is, which is there. Uh, Robert Jackson famously said that uh, sovereignty was the, the basic grammar uh, of modern politics and modern law. Uh, that's a contentious phrase, but I, I, I think there's a lot to it. But I think it only tells half the story. I think it's also a lot of the, the rhetoric associated with modern politics and modern law. Uh, a lot of the poetics is also associated with, with, with sovereignty. So it's not just the grammar, it's not just a deep structure in terms of how we think about the, the global order, it's also how we imagine it, how we uh, how we think about identity, how we think about the, the dignity of nations or different forms of community, etc., etc. So sovereignty has a, an emotive significance as well as a kind of uh, uh, a structural effect on, 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 the, on the transnational polity. Thank you. Okay. No, thanks. And I kind of wanted to draw on this idea of sovereignty having kind of continued currency and sort of ask what's What's really its utility now as a, as a kind of phrase, yeah. concept? Uh, utility is <laughs> obstinate presence, I think. Uh, so, so I think part of this is, you know, part of the challenge here, and maybe this is particularly interesting for a, an interdisciplinary audience, uh, I think if you're coming, certainly if you're coming out from a, a, a legal perspective, 
And I think to some extent, from a political theory perspective, sovereignty is probably going to be a more central concept than, say, if you're looking at this as an economist uh, or uh, uh, as uh, uh, a certain type of uh, political scientist or a political sociologist, etc., etc. You know, because sovereignty is something which is very, very high within the register of legal thought, to some extent within the register of political thought. Uh, not necessarily economic thought, uh, which is far more about the private and the market, etc., etc. Uh, so, now, that doesn't mean that one register is right and one register is wrong. I think the danger is that uh, we uh, people only concentrate on one register. I don't think you can account for the global order through the concept of sovereignty. But I also don't think you can account for the global order without taking into account at some level, the, the idea of sovereignty. And uh, the, I think what sovereignty does, uh, and I would, I would sum it up in, in maybe in three different ways. I think it has a certain sort of epistemic significance. And what I mean by that is how we know the world uh, politically is through notions of sovereignty, how we understand states, we decipher states, we decipher uh, the, the global constellation, I think, through uh, thinking of sovereign units and the relationships between them. So it has that basic epistemic significance, which I think is very, very difficult to overcome. Uh, I think it also has a symbolic significance. Uh, perhaps we can talk about this later, but the uh, number of people who voted for Brexit, you know, uh, citing sovereignty, whatever that means, we'll come back to that, uh, as a reason why they were doing so, taking back control. So there's a sense in which uh, uh, sovereignty is very, very closely associated with what you might call the politics of recognition. It's still seen as a supreme form of political recognition. Uh, so it has that sort of significance as well. I think it also has a material significance in that uh, if we think uh, about States as being the paradigmatic instances of sovereign, uh, sovereignty, then you know, a massive number of material advantages flow from that. Treaty making powers, etc., uh, etc., et control over borders, control over material resources, etc. So the whole material organisation uh, of a public space, not necessarily private space, but public space, is something which is framed through sovereignty. So these are three factors. So when you ask me about the utility, I think that, that maybe I would say the indispensability. You know, one, one cannot think about the organisation of the world, either in terms of its imagination or in terms of its material effects, uh, other than through the notion of sovereignty. You need a lot more than sovereignty, but you also need sovereignty. And you, you, so you mentioned that several people who voted Brexit quoted sovereignty. Do you think we can understand Brexit as a taking back of sovereignty? Uh, <laughs> who, who understands Brexit? <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, I have to ask someone. But the, uh, the, so, I, so there are some interesting stats, you know, because I think a lot of people think that uh, sovereignty, and this goes back to the, the emotive or symbolic significance of sovereignty, a lot of people think that sovereignty is a term which is a term of art that belongs, it begins within a, it, it belongs within a, an intellectual and academic register. But actually, if you look at some of the studies on Brexit, uh, one study showed that I think 53% of people said that they, the main reason uh, they had for Brexit was they could have said some economic advantage, they could have mentioned immigration, they could have mentioned a whole bunch of specific things, but they actually mentioned the S word actually mentioned sovereignty, right? Also, perhaps even more telling, uh, of those uh, uh, of those people who said the most significant thing at issue in the Brexit debate was sovereignty, ninety percent of them voted uh, uh, to leave, right? So, if you thought about sovereignty, if sovereignty was high up in your register of thought, then you were thinking in terms of, of leaving. Now, uh, what that actually means. You know, the, the, the is, I mean, partly it is, clearly it, there is, one cannot trash people for what they think just because they cannot give material examples. So one might, one, one has to recognise then that it does have an emotive significance. It is something which is relevant within the politics of identity, regardless of 
what happens next in terms of its material consequences. I guess one point I would make is that if we think about the prize of sovereignty in terms of its external effects, not just the fact that it, it speaks to self-government within the community, but its external effects in, in, in a world which, uh, where sovereign authority is increasingly supplemented by supranational authority, then one of the things you might achieve through Brexit is, is a degree of autonomy, right? Your voice becomes autonomous. Uh, but if you think about all the things that people assume that go along with that, and which are also seen as dimensions of sovereignty, then it becomes much more problematic. And one of the things that we, we take for granted with sovereignty is the, the integrity of the sovereign entity itself. Well, you know, if you're in a situation where leaving a larger entity, for example, problematizes the relationship between the different nations of the UK, as it has, because so much has to be brought back from Brussels, and a big argument about whether things should go to the centre of locality, then actually distancing yourself from larger entities can actually make your own internal integrity problematic. Also, if you think of it in terms of influence, you know, the autonomy of voice is sometimes inversely related to the, the strength of that voice or the influence that you have. You no longer speak as part of a, a group of 500 million people, but now a group of 60 million, etc., etc. And capacity also. Uh, uh, one estimate said that on the day of Brexit, the UK will have to revisit 759 separate agreements, which, you know, say, okay, they can be rolled over, but they're going to be rolled over. Well, what's the point of the autonomy in the first place? So the point is that you do get autonomy of voice at some level, but you, you maybe lose something in terms of integrity, in terms of influence, in terms of capacity. And people have to make up their mind, you know, what the balance is between these things, you know. And that's me trying to be as neutral as possible. People have to make up their mind. That sovereignty doesn't necessarily imply greater power. It implies a degree of greater autonomy, but that can then be compromised by the other aspects which I which mentioned. No, I think that feeds really nicely into our next question, which is kind of in terms of the degree of power that people might think they're gaining through, uh, through regaining sovereignty, and, and kind of to switch here to this increased use of the language kind of surrounding populism in politics yeah. at the moment and kind of how populism and how you understand populism as relating to sovereignty and to kind of how do you understand the relationship between populism and popular sovereignty yeah. and okay that's that's <laughs> very topical very <laughs> difficult question i think so first of all i mean we have to we have to accept that you know populism itself is in a, 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 a contested concept you know, uh, we don't uh, all mean the same thing by it, and there's a there's a very respectable tradition of thinking about populism in a way where it would simply mean popular sovereignty, right? It would mean uh, trying to make sure that there are mechanisms within the political order which uh, optimises sensitivity of political decision making to popular control, whatever that might mean. And you know, there are many many respectable ways of thinking about this, both from the right and from the left. Uh, and, uh, for example, there's a, there's a tradition of uh, left thinking associated with uh, Chateau Mouffe and various other people, which says that the important thing uh, about populism, she defines it, is not just that you would have very, very kind of sensitive mechanisms of political representation and accountability, uh, but you would also uh, have uh, different different policy projects available, right? Uh, so it wouldn't just be a choice between different, certainly different versions of neoliberalism. It would actually be, you know, there would actually be a genuine choice within the, uh, uh, the political community. And in fact, one of the critiques of the new populism which is coming along to the moment is, is that what's happened there is that the absence of viable political alternatives has created a new form of identity politics, you know, which acts as a kind of 
substitute for, a poor substitute for something which would actually look like an alternative political agenda. And the point there is that I think what populism does, the type of populism which I think is dangerous, is that it, uh, so basically it always assumes to speak in the name of the people. It's a politics of resentment. It's a party of resentments against elites, whoever they might be. Uh, often, <laughs> elites lead the politics of resentment against elites, and that's one of the paradoxes of populism. Uh, it's a politics which is which emphasises the collective over the individual. It's a politics which emphasises the uh, unity of the group against pluralism. It's a politics which is tribal and divisive. It treats the other not as an adversary but as an enemy. Uh, it's a politics which plays fast and loose with a lot of the constitutional mechanisms we have for tempering power rather than for articulating and strengthening power. Uh, and so it always has a very ambivalent relationship to, to constitutionalism. Uh, so the problem is that the very things that popular uh, uh, sovereignty does, popular sovereignty take seriously what you might call the, the paradox of constituent power. It says, we give, we start with power to the people. Uh, but ever since the French Revolution, and between the Girondins and Jacobins, we've had this fight about what does that actually mean? You know, how you can't have direct power in a modern, uh, vast polity. But representation, you know, is, uh, is full of traps. Representation can be attenuated, it can be frustrated, etc., etc. Under what circumstances can you ask the people to speak again? What are the constitutional amendment mechanisms? What is the everyday structure of democracy, etc., etc.? How do you keep people involved? How do you find a good balance between direct and representative democracy at the local level, etc.? These are all really, really hard questions of constitutional architecture. Populism says they're not hard. Populism says no, you know, there is something, there is a way in which we can speak in the name of the people. You know, so basically what it does is that it makes a very, very powerful rhetorical claim. Margaret Canavan, I think, said that if you want to understand the social psychology of populism, you have to understand it as the, uh, the, the, the permanent redemptive shadow that hangs over the limitations of representative democracy, right? We know that representative democracy is limited and it doesn't always work in all sorts of ways. And there's always this sense that there could be something better, that people should be allowed to speak more clearly. And what one of the things that populism does is it, 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 it gives air to the frustration associated with that. It doesn't resolve the problem. It just waves a, waves a magic wand and says, you know, this is what the people really think, rather than saying, let's have better popular constitutionalism would say, okay, you know, our forms of constitutionalism are deficient, so, so how, let's, let's go back into the democratic laboratory and try to work out better democratic mechanisms, rather than simply uh, going to the account and say, okay, you know, uh, uh, I am Trump, or I am Orban, or I am Erdogan, and I speak for the people. So uh, I think they are, they are two very, very different things, and they should be confused. Okay. You've also been <coughs> working on a project relating to the EU as uh, an experimental project, okay. and so we were wondering what provoked you to start working on this topic, and where, where has it led you? I wish I knew. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, so actually, no, that's a very interesting question. Thank you, I, and I think. Uh, so, so it's one of these things that I think maybe like a lot of people, often I get my ideas by, so I see something in the media or whatever, and I see a trend, I think, okay, this is interesting, I don't quite understand this trend, so I want to understand it in a, in a deeper way. So how this started was, around about the time of the, the Brexit referendum, perhaps a few months before, I started noticing uh, the ways in which uh, many people refer to the EU in experimental terms. Okay? And there's two ways in which this happened. 
The first way was uh, a very, very kind of urgent and immediate way, right? Uh, and often very, very pejorative. The idea of the, 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 the failed experiment, you know, or the experiment which was once great. People talk about noble experiments which have had their day. Or Michael Gove famously described the EU as a Frankenstein experiment, right? And uh, so basically it's been used in a very, very negative sense. And so what you get there is a whole imagery of, uh, of this kind of hubristic experimental polity, you know, which was trying to do something new, you know, and, uh, you know, like Icarus, you know, it flew too close to the sun, the thing that somehow crashed and finally it ran out of energy or whatever it might be. So there, there are more or less critical views on this, but even people who you would think are friends of the EU, people like George Soros, would say these sorts of things and say, look, you know, th this experiment has lost its, it's lost its vigour, it's become a tired experiment, it's outlived its usefulness, etc, etc. So I thought, okay, so what's going on here? Uh, and then at the same time, so I started digging a little bit deeper, and then I noticed that there's another use of, of, of experimental language in the EU, which is far more casual, right? Uh, where people, you, you barely notice it. Uh, and so I started looking at, you know, quite significant writers. Jürgen Habermas, uh, uh, Jeremy Waldron, Bruno de Witte, a big PC vote on international laws and experiment in the EU. And I thought, what do people mean? Why, why, why are they using that term in such a casual way? And they clearly weren't using it in the pejorative way that the, the, the more recent political commentators were. And I thought, it is because, you know, they assume that whatever else we know or don't know about the EU, there is something massively experimental about it. Now, why that then becomes part of a pejorative discourse is something we have to explain at stage two. But at stage one, what we can do at least is try to understand why there might have been such a clear sense of this as being an experimental quality. So what I've been doing is saying, okay, uh, what, in what ways is it an experimental quality? Uh, the, the, and there's a number of different ways, all of which are known, I think, but maybe it's when you bring them all together, you get the aggregation of it, you realise quite what an audacious experiment it is. So first of all, I think, and I would say this because I'm a lawyer, it's a legal experiment, okay? Uh, and one of the ways we know this is we don't have the language to describe it, you know. Uh, oh, it's not, you know, supranational law, or is it international law, is it another form of state law, is it a form of private law, that's, you know, we, we, we get very, very confused and, and often we just throw labels at each other and don't really understand what we're talking about. And I do think there's something, there's a way in which, you know, as, as, a, as a president, president of the EUI said, you know, around the hoods, you know, there's a way in which, you know, law is both the, uh, you know, the agent and object of the polity. Law has to do a huge amount of heavy lifting within the EU. Usually within a political structure, it's secondary. You know, it's, it's something which follows on from culture or follows on from some sort of material power. Law has a much more central role. That's something which is fundamentally new. It's also an institutional experiment. And again, you know, we know that because the language is a state, is a confederation. We know that it's not either of these sorts of things. It's not interesting to say that. Nor is it interesting to say it's simply sui generis, but we do have to understand that institutionally it's an experiment. I call it the, the acephalous polity, you know, a polity without head. But it is something, you know, which in that sense is very, very new. Very post-sovereign, <laughs> to go back to an earlier part of our discussion. Uh, it's also a political, uh, sorry, no, it's a cultural experiment uh, in the sense that uh, experiment in political culture in that you have mandatory plural citizenship. There's no other time in, 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 in uh, you know, where we, people have had mandatory, you know, people, some people can be plural citizens, they can be, they, they, they can, but now it's mandatory. You have to be a citizen of both. That's an audaciously new thing to suggest to people. So, and it actually suggests that the notion of citizenship itself becomes, breaks apart because we think of citizenship as being about relationship to a single community. So there's something really interesting going on there as well. Finally, it's also a political experiment. And the way I would describe this is that we've always made the distinction between the state and, let's call them, single-purpose polities. Hayek made the distinction between uh, 
uh, a, a, a teleocracy, which has a specific purpose, and a, a nomocracy, you know, which has a general purpose. Or what I call the distinction between the pursuit of particular public goods and the pursuit of uh, the public good. Right. And uh, the EU has never been able to make us up its mind whether it's about the pursuit of an aggregation of public goods or whether it's a pursuit of something called the European public good. Okay? Now, my point is that there's a massively experimental dimension in each of these and they're all closely associated with each other. And also from the beginning, this is built in you know, reflexively to the polity. So if you go back to the beginning of this, let's say we go back to the Federalist Papers and the making of the American Constitution, there, there's, what you have there is an experiment in a designed polity, right? And what Hamilton says is, look, with this we'll find out, the Federalist Papers, Alexander Hamilton said, we'll find out whether, you know, we are forever, you know, just going to be the, the you know, the playthings of fortune and fate, or where we get to design our own political forms. The experiment of the EU is a different sort of experiment. Not just in, in the sense that it's asking all these difficult questions, but it's the whole Mori method, the whole Schumann Declaration, is built upon the notion that this is a deeply open-ended thing. We don't know where it will end. So it's an experiment in the very idea of something which is experimentally open-ended. Now, I think that uh, We've, in some ways, to put it very crudely, we've reached crunch point with all of these experiments. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, and one of the reasons why we have pejorative language associated with experimentalism now is precisely because of that. But uh, I don't want to say any more, otherwise I give away an ending one good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, maybe just, just one last question. Um, it's kind of building on this idea of the experimental method. And so when we talk a lot about crises at the moment, so like the migration crisis, Brexit as a crisis, also the financial crisis. Do you think this is an, it's a sense of a failure of the experiment, or do you think when we talk about failure of the experiment, we're actually not really recognising the experimental nature, so it kind of presumes some kind of finality or some kind of European super-state? Um, yeah, I think, I think, look, I, I think, I think the, uh, uh, I think one of the problems is that and this, this does link back to a discussion of sovereignty, that uh, the reason why this is an experiment is that it's trying to, you know, it's trying to split the sovereign atom. You know, it is. You know, I mean, a lot of the things we associate with, with sovereignty are just basically challenged by the existence of the EU. They always have been, you know, and you know, I talk about it in the paper I give today, and, and, the, uh, and there's a the tendency maybe to on the one hand, to take that for granted, right? On the other hand, you know, to uh, begin to underestimate, you know, the massive difficulties involved in sustaining that kind of experiment in a new political form, where when there is no genus of which it's a species, right? When it's the only type, and uh, that of course are, are a regional trade on many of them, but. There's nothing quite like the EU. Uh, so I think the EU is always going to get a sceptical press, okay, at some level. Uh, I think also a lot of people who are internal to the EU want to resolve it in a way, you know, that there always has been a federalist element within the EU. There always has been a kind of cryptic state building element. Uh, there's also another element which would happily see it as uh, as something which is very, very much like a traditional deferential secondary international organisation. I mean, one of the narratives of Brexit is that somehow it was like that until the Treaty of Maastricht, which it wasn't. <laughs> and then that day, you know, that's the day that we sold our soul to the European devil, you know, because thereafter, you know, Europe became this, this larger supranational thing, which is a fantastic simplification, fantastic oversimplification. So I think there's a tendency to look at the you know, to look at the new metaphorically digital age of the EU through analog specs and to still see it in these old sorts of terms in ways which, uh, 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 in ways which uh, make it, there's a kind of almost like breakdown of understanding both within the polity and outside it which, which come together as a kind of almost like radical lack of sympathy 
with what the EU is trying to achieve. And of course, a lot of populism within Europe, you know, uh, uh, somehow uh, gets hold of this scepticism in a very, very crude form and, uh, uh, and makes it very, very effective. And sometimes one fears that the EU itself doesn't necessarily have the resources to resolve that. And I think one of the problems, to, to just to come back to the populism point briefly again, is that populism is fantastically effective at dichotomizing. Right, you know. So either you know you are the people or you are the elite. So basically, you know, your 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 chance of participating in the debate legitimately is almost framed out of existence a priori by the populists and by the way they talk about that. Now, there's no reason why populism has to frame political debate, but it has become very effective at framing political debate. And I think one of the, the massive challenges for the EU is to try to understand. You know, what, what, uh, what lies behind the appeal of populism, you know, and try to counter that directly, but not in a way which accepts the populist framing of the problem. Wow, well, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts and insights with, with us, Neil, and we very much look forward to your lecture tonight. Thanks very thank much for talking to me. Thank you.